Red Jacket Red Jacket was no fabled warrior. His favorite weapon was his eloquence. Never a musket. Colonel McKenney compared him to Cicero, a man who better understood how to lead his countrymen to war instead of leading them into battle. He first appeared as the spokesman of his people during the 1786 Great Council of the Confederated Indians, held at the mouth of the Detroit River. The Six Nations above all Indian nations were lovers of intelligence and eloquence. The notes of that treaty described his address as a masterpiece of oratory and the oratorical powers of Red Jacket were compared to the Virginian John Randolph, whose silver voice and brilliance never failed to cast a spell over the Senate. Brethren of the United States of America, peace has been made between the King of Great Britain and you. But we, the Indians, were disappointed finding ourselves not included in that peace, that the quarrel between us was not of our own making, that any cessation of our lands should be made in the most public manner and by the united voice of the Confederacy. We think it is owing to you that essential good has been followed by mischief and confusion, having managed everything respecting your own way. You kindled your council fires without consulting us, even when in council, Several eminent chiefs were killed when absolutely engaged in promoting a peace with you, the Thirteen United States. We request of you to order your surveyors and others that mark out land to cease from crossing the Ohio until we shall have spoken to you. It shall not be our fault if the plan which we have suggested to you should not be carried into execution. If we should thereby be reduced to misfortune, the world will pity us when they think of the proposals we now make to prevent the unnecessary effusion of blood. In March 1792, Red Jacket led 50 Iroquois chiefs into Philadelphia as guests of Washington and his cabinet. General St. Clair had been routed in a bloody defeat in the previous fall, a bitter reverse to the hopes of the young republic. It was feared that the British might again arm the still powerful Iroquois Confederacy and its warriors would fall on the feeble sentiments of the Niagara frontier. And again, leave the Mohawk in flames. Red Jacket was the principal speaker at this lengthy council in which the Iroquois chiefs finally, reluctantly, agreed to act as mediators between the United States and the warring tribes of the West. Several years later, Red Jacket led his chiefs to Connecticut, where he appeared in a dispute with the Connecticut Land Company, which claimed a large section of the present state of Ohio, then called New Connecticut. The Six Nations insisted it was their territory by right of conquest. A man who was there recalled, for William L. Stone, the Seneca's biographer, how Red Jacket ended. We stand a small island in the bosom of the great waters. We are enriched. We are encircled we are encompassed. The evil spirits ride upon the blast and the waters are disturbed. 
They rise, they press upon us, and the waves will settle over us and we shall disappear forever. Who then lives to mourn us, white man? None. What marks our extermination? Nothing. We are mingled with the common elements. Once an agent of the Missionary Society of Albany led a group of missionaries to the land of the Seneca. Red Jacket finally agreed to listen to their arguments as to why they should become Christians. After hours of talk to which he listened with a great deal of courtesy, he rose and faced the black coats, as he called them. His reply was long, but he said in part, Brother, you think us ignorant and uninformed. Go then and teach the whites. Select, for example, the people of Buffalo. We will be the spectators and remain silent. Improve their morals and refine their habits. Make them less disposed to cheat the Indians. Make the whites less inclined to make the Indian drunk and to take away their lands. Let us know the tree by the blossoms and the blossoms by the fruit. When this shall be made clear to our minds, we may be more willing to listen to you. I have spoken. <laughs> he died January the 20th, 1830, in a small clapboard house in the Seneca village. He was about 74. <laughs> When the local missionary heard that the chiefs intended to bury Red Jacket with pagan ceremonies, he indignantly assembled his party, took possession of the body, and conveyed it to their meeting house. Services were completed, and the missionary asked the chiefs if they wished to say a last word. One old man rose and in a quivering voice replied, This house was built for the white man, the friends of Red Jacket, cannot be heard in it. Black Coats had pursued the old Seneca to his grave. Thank you.